Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to the second day of the Middleway Society's virtual festival, or our virtual Middleway Festival of the Middleway, even. Um, this morning's talk, uh, starting at 10, which is now, um, is with Ian McGilchrist, who um, many of you will have um, already watched The Divided Brain last night and uh, been present at the question and answer session there. Um, so uh, I have a, a, a piece that I've prepared. Let me drag that across. Okay, so um, our speaker in this session is going to be Ian McGilchrist, as I've said, and I'm fairly confident that most of you are already familiar with his life and work. Um, Ian has been a patron of the Middleway Society since 2013, and we're very pleased that he's able to speak with you all at this, our first Festival of the Middleway. Um, Robert Ellis, founder and chair of our society, describes Ian's book, The Master and His Emissary, as an important work of synthetic thought, which focuses on the differing specializations of the two hemispheres of the brain and their massive effect on human thinking and cultural history. Although Ian's book does not make explicit reference to the middle way, it does so implicitly in a great variety of ways and provides a possible scientific approach to understanding the physical conditions that give rise to the need for a middle way. Ian's life also shows a multidisciplinary approach to experience that has enabled him to gain synthetic understanding of a kind that's very helpful for engaging with the middle way. Starting out his academic career as a scholar of literature, he then retrained and repractised as a psychiatrist. He is now devoted to his writing work and lives on the Isle of Skye from where he joins us today. If during the talk you think of a question you'd like to put to Ian, please type it into the Zoom meeting chat box and I'll select those after Ian's uh, finished speaking and probably uh, be able to give you the chance to ask your question. Um, out loud. Um, please uh, be aware this session is being recorded um, so that people who aren't able to make it can watch it later. If you ask a question and don't wish to be seen or heard, uh, we can always remove you or make you anonymous when the video is edited. So uh, let me or Robert or Barry know about that. Um, I'm just going to admit the last few people who are waiting and then I shall hand you over to Ian. Ian. Well, um, thank you very much, Jim. Um, thank you for the words of introduction and welcome to all of you here um, from a remarkably sunny Isle of Skye. Um, I think from uh, what I've learned, we've had a lot of windy, wet weather when you've all been basking um, further south, but to, today is a basking day for me. Anyway, um, I'm not going to attempt in any way to um, try and fill people in on the thesis of the master and his emissary because I want to uh, say just a few very targeted things this morning. Um, so I'm going to either assume largely that you, you know about my thesis or if you don't you can catch up on it and there's a terrifically good little cartoon on YouTube which has had a couple of million views. Um, and it was based on the talk I gave in the RSA in 2010. And I think it formed quite a good introduction if you haven't seen it. If you Google McGilchrist RSA animate, it will come up. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, being in the phase of uh, talking to people after the book, which is now 10 years actually since it came out, and still seems to be being, I'm very glad to say, uh, read and discussed. Um, one of the things that's come out of it has been how many people, uh, Buddhists, have uh, expressed um, interest and even enthusiasm for what it is I say. And uh, I feel rather like the character of Monsieur Jourdain in Molière's um, play Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, who was being taught um, grammar and uh, so forth by um, a tutor so that he could appear to know more than he did. And he was told that he, he was speaking prose. And he said, my goodness, all my life I've been speaking prose and I didn't know it. Well, I feel a little bit like that. All my life I've been a Buddhist, but I really wasn't aware of it. Um, most of what I have to say, uh, I can now see, is enormously in line with um, what Buddhists would, uh, would think and believe. So what I'm just going to do is, is say, um, in, in, in very much in brief, the, the two hemispheres of the brain have evolved to be distinct. Uh, they are connected, but their connection uh, is 
a great deal in service of uh, keeping the two separate and distinct. Why? Uh, I believe this is because we have to pay two kinds of attention to the world at once. One is narrowly focused and targeted on something we're interested in getting. Uh, and that has a sort of narrow beam, but very precise quality to it. It only sees a tiny part of the picture, perhaps three degrees out of the 360. But at the same time, if we're to survive while we're grabbing food or getting things to, 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 to manipulate or, or, or um, to act on the world, we need also to be looking out for the whole picture. Uh, not only for predators, but also for our mates and our conspecifics and generally taking in the scene. So we have one kind of attention that is very local, focused and targeted, and one that is very broad, sustained and vigilant. Uh, the first is typical of the left hemisphere and the second of the right. And this is not any kind of a metaphor only. It is uh, a literal truth. If people have strokes, you can see this phenomenon. Now, this results in the coming to presence of two different kinds of a world because the attention you pay governs what it is you find. And if you pay a very narrowly focused piecemeal attention to something that's already of interest to you, you will find things that are fragmented. Um, and familiar, but have to be put together in some way in order to create a whole picture. Whereas if you have a broad, sustained, vigilant attention to the world, you see everything is already seamlessly connected. You don't need to put things effortfully together. In fact, the fact that there are things that are separate is an artifact of uh, this rather narrowly focused attention. So I'm just going to run through a few of the um, what I call dipoles um, of quality between these two visions. I call them dipoles because they're like a magnet in that you simply cannot have a North Pole without a South Pole. You can't say, well, I like the North Pole. I don't really like the South Pole. I'm going to cut it off. All that will happen is that you have a shorter magnet and the North Pole and the South Pole are closer together. So we can't have these things um, without one another, and yet each is quite distinct. There's no way you can confuse the North Pole with the South Pole, and they can't act for one another. There also isn't a very clear boundary point between them, only a graduated one. So what are these dipoles? Well, they follow from these two kinds of attention. The left hemisphere prefers things that are familiar. It's trying to grasp something, and it already thinks, I want that. I want that seed. I want that rabbit. I want that twig, whatever it is. I know what it is. I've locked onto it, and I'm going to get it. So it prefers things it's familiar with, and it knows exactly what they are. Whereas the right hemisphere is open to whatever is new, whatever doesn't fit in to the current categories. Uh, all of these things will sound a little bit um, as though they're uh, only metaphors. I, I don't think there's anything only about metaphors, by the way. I think they're how we come to understand the world. But nonetheless, they have um, literal, for those of you who are interested, literal neuropsychological correlates that can be experimentally demonstrated and can be seen in patients who have lesions either in the right or the left hemisphere. The purpose of the left hemisphere is to make sure it's got hold of something, so it prefers certainty. Uh, but the right hemisphere is the one that opens up to possibility. A very well-known neuroscientist, V.S. Ramachandran, calls the right hemisphere the devil's advocate, because where the left hemisphere is going, I know, it's one of those, it goes in that box, the right hemisphere is going, yes, but it's not actually quite like those, and it might be better to think of it over here. So these are the sort of distinctions. If you like, the left hemisphere is narrowing down all the time to a certainty that it can get hold of, grasp. And grasping is what the left hemisphere does with the right hand. Um, but 
The right hemisphere, meanwhile, is opening up to possibility. It's trying to see what is there that is beyond our categories, beyond our normal language terms. And it's true that the left hemisphere is the speaking hemisphere for most certainly right-handed people, 97% of them. Um, but it's also the speaking hemisphere for 60% of left-handers. And it is the one that controls speech, but it's not the one that controls all of language. It is, however, the one that controls the aspect of language whereby we narrow things down to a certainty. All the bits where we open up to a possibility through the implicit, through indeed poetic metaphor, through uh, what is not said as much as what is, is said, through the tone of voice, through body language, and through facial expression. All that is from the right hemisphere. Here again, and this is, I, I throw it out as a, what may appear a rather small thing, but it is in fact so important a thing that it's formed possibly the basis the, 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 one of the main messages, at any rate, of um, the book I've just finished writing, which I'm hoping will be called The Matter with Things, um, in, in which I contrast a world in which the seamless flow is broken up into still frames, rather like um, a juddering cine film or like stop-go animation. So the left hemisphere, if you remember, is targeting things. So it freezes whatever it is and decontextualizes it in space and time. So it is isolated and readily graspable. Meanwhile, the right hemisphere is seeing that it is actually a continuous process in which whatever looks like it's fixed is being willfully extrapolated from the flow for our purposes. This goes with the idea that the left hemisphere sees fragments, parts, whereas the right hemisphere sees the whole. And it's true that we do learn about a whole by looking at its parts. We don't learn, of course, everything about it, but we learn something about it. But it's also true that we only understand the parts when we see that actually they go to make up a certain whole. That's partly because every th single thing changes what it is in the context in which it lies. It can't be just taken out of context and you can't then find out what it actually is and then put it back because it is immediately something different when it is in a context and in real world rather than in theory everything actually has a context also i'd like you to re remember that parts and holes are not absolute they are in a way holographic in that what looks like a part at one level can look like a whole at another. And when you start building up the universe from subatomic particles, you come to atoms, to molecules, to um, larger molecules like proteins, to single cells, to organs, to organisms, to societies, to civilizations, to the cosmos, and whatever that lies outside our knowledge. So everything is in one way apart and in another way a whole. One image that I am constantly recurring to these days is a Vedic image uh, of what is called Indra's net, which is a net that covers the cosmos and it has two or three really important points to make as far as I'm concerned. One is that in that net what attracts our attention is the crossing places of the threads, the nodes, if you like, but these actually arise out of relations. So instead of thinking of the world as consisting of things which are then related, it is an image of relations that pre-exist the things. The things are what attract our attention within the overall network. And in the image of Indra's net, at each place where the, um, the fibers cross in the net, there is suspended a jewel, like a drop of dew, um, in which all other of the jewels and all the rest of the net is reflected. So uh, once again, you have this image of the whole in uh, what might be thought of as the part. But in any case, on a more mundane level, the left hemisphere sees parts. So for example, it sees the body as made up of a leg, uh, or perhaps even two, uh, arms, 
um, a, a, a trunk, a head, an ear, an eye, a nose, all of that sort of thing. Whereas the body image, which is the picture of the whole body, but not just a picture in visual terms, but a, an image of the body in all senses is in the right hemisphere. And the right hemisphere specializes in what is called Gestalt perception. Gestalt is a German term which came into English probably through the Gestalt psychology school, but it's a term that doesn't have an exact um, equivalent in English, but what it means is um, a sort of a whole, a form um, that encompasses things and which is not separate from other things, but is a new take, if you like, a new way of looking at the world. And I believe that in philosophy, um, what one is doing, and indeed in science, what one is doing is replacing one gestalt with another. And the only reason to replace the existing gestalt with another is that the one that you prefer, the one that you want to introduce and replace the old one, accounts for more. It simply squares with more of what we know. Going with all this, the left hemisphere is really very much confined to the explicit. It, 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 it understands what is made thoroughly explicit and could be conveyed in prose to another human being who could read it and understand what is being said. But of course, in our communications and in our understanding, the vast majority of what goes on is not explicit at all. It never perhaps even reaches consciousness certainly cannot necessarily be articulated in words that will pass on to another person the experience um, to which one is referring in language. The left hemisphere has this focus therefore on what can be made clear and precise and explicit, whereas the left, sorry, the right hemisphere is meanwhile um, tuned in to what is implicit, what is not being said, all the ramifications, and is therefore much better at understanding irony, sense of humour, poetry, religious language, and so forth. The left hemisphere, in order to be able to manipulate uh, material, ideas, things, puts them into abstract categories, and it tends to abstract what it considers the essence of something, so that instead of seeing a unique table or book or whatever, it sees category, table, category, book. Um, and it's thus cut off the sensual, perceptual, experiential, empirical aspect of what we experience and substituted for it an idea. Whereas because the right hemisphere appreciates seeing much more of the picture, that everything exists only in a context, it sees things much more embodied and in situ where they are in the world. And this means that it tends to see the unique. It tends to understand the unique case, whereas the left hemisphere tends to see more the general, um, the general category. And this is brought into focus by a couple of cases, both of them as it happens from Swiss patients who had right hemisphere strokes. One of them was a farmer and before his stroke he knew all his cattle um, by sight and by name but after the stroke he could barely tell the difference between a cow and a horse. And there was a, a, a woman who'd made it her life's work to study the birds of Switzerland and knew them all very well and after her right hemisphere stroke she said plaintively all the birds look the same. That brings it home quite vividly I think. For this reason, the right hemisphere is more tuned into the qualities of things, what makes them specifically what they are. And when I say qualities, I mean the specific nature of this individual, because qualities can also become generic. So uh, if I'm asked to describe somebody, I can say, well, they're of a certain height, a certain complexion, certain hair color, and they have certain qualities like a good sense of humor, uh, or, or whatever it might be. But then when you actually are left with this handful of descriptors, you have no way to convey the essence of what it is that your friend is. That person is only 
a unique instance and their qualities are all the qualities of that person, which can then be generalized in the left hemisphere. But basically the right hemisphere is more interested in quality, the left hemisphere in quantity, because it's got a category and it's seeing how many can I get into this box? And it considers that more of something is better. There is also a distinction between the hemispheres in their dealing with the realm of the inanimate and the animate. The right hemisphere is more in tune with the animate, the left hemisphere with the inanimate. That's a very broad generalization, but it has, um, it has reliable neuropsychological correlates. The left hemisphere is particularly good at naming and understanding things as a tools, because remember, its raison d'etre is to grasp, to manipulate, to have power and control over um, its environment, whereas the right hemisphere is more in tune with things that are animate um, and the two hemispheres code somewhat differently for inanimate things and animate things. One thing that's particularly interesting to me is that the right hemisphere sees musical instruments as animate, uh, which is, you know, goes with my sense of what a musical instrument is, a sort of extension of the soul of a living being. And then there is um, <laughs> A fascinating difference which is which is part of the fact that the right hemisphere is much more veridical it's much more true to reality than the left hemisphere if you don't know very much about my work you might still believe the old um, things that were said about hemisphere differences almost all of which are incorrect um, virtually everything that is has been said uh, historically over the last few decades about the differences between the hemispheres is not true. One of the main exceptions is this business of small attention to detail in the left hemisphere and broader perception of a whole in the right hemisphere. That has been one of the things that has been noted and it is true, but almost all the other things are wrong. For example, the left hemisphere is not unemotional, a little bit boring, but at least reliable. It's utterly unreliable. It lives in a world of denial a great deal of the time, and it's also very quick to anger. Anger is one of the emotions that most clearly lateralizes, and guess what? It lateralizes to the left hemisphere. But in any case, to come back to what I want to say, the right hemisphere is much more realistic. It's a much better guide to what's actually going on, because after all, it's seeing more of what's going on altogether. It's seeing the big picture. The left hemisphere, seeing what it wants to see largely, tends to be absurdly optimistic. And some of you will have heard me describe it, but for those of you who haven't, I will describe it again. There is a very striking clinical phenomenon which occurs after a right hemisphere stroke, which is that somebody may have half their body paralyzed and they may entirely deny that there's anything wrong with it. In fact, when asked about it, they will tend to change the conversation. And if asked to demonstrate movement, they will pretend that something has moved and say they can't see there's a problem when nothing, of course, has moved. So they're absolutely in denial about what has been lost. And they tend to confabulate. To confabulate is not exactly to lie because the person doesn't, uh, doesn't willfully um, execute a deceit, but the person is actually making up something that enables them to carry on comfortably believing what they believe. So to fill in, you know, where this doesn't square with your story that you can run 100 meters in, you know, 30 seconds and because you're paralyzed, they will, they will make up a story which explains what happened. And, 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 and a very nice story um, told me by a colleague uh, that a, a patient of his um, had had his garage designed by a friend. And of course the garage was fine, but after a right hemisphere stroke, the patient's vision on the left wasn't very good. And on half a dozen occasions, he misjudged the entrance to the garage and uh, damaged the, the, the left side of the car going in. And instead of it occurring to him that he might have made an error, um, he said, that architect, and I thought he was a friend of mine, and yet he's come in the night and changed the, 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 the shape of the entry to my garage. That just shows what a friend he was to me. So this is really very extreme stuff. And, and 
I, I will just say the words Donald Trump, and then I will move on. Now, uh, the, there is a, a very, very important difference between, uh, and, and this may again not ring an immediate bell, or it will with some of you, the difference between presencing and representing. Presencing is a term of art in philosophy, which is a translation of Heidegger's word Anwesen. Um, Anwesen, in fact, when Heidegger started uh, writing, was a noun as presence is in English, but he turned it into a verb, to presence. And to presence is for something to come into being in front of you actively, not just to be present in a rather sort of passive way. So presencing is the coming into being between you and something of that whatever it is. And this is really what the right hemisphere allows to happen, something presences to it. Almost immediately it's taken to the left hemisphere where it is now literally no longer present but re-presented after the fact. And a representation of something immediately takes over from the presence. You have to be quite alert to still be present with the thing before the left hemisphere has already put it in a box, categorized it and effectively killed it. And this is a process that Wordsworth decried and lamented um, repeatedly, that when he was young, things presenced to him, nature presenced, a simple thing like a rock or a tree or a, or a mountainside, to him was a presence that spoke to him and he to it, but that as he got older, he couldn't help seeing it as a picturesque landscape, one of those. Its power was robbed by being already, if you like, generalized, abstracted and represented. Now, if I put those aspects together, you can see that the left hemisphere prefers a world which is known, familiar, certain, fixed, built up clearly from parts, generally abstract and represented in the mind in a general way, and it has become inanimate. And the whole experience is colored by an unrealistic sense of control, satisfaction, and optimism. Whereas the right hemisphere sees that nothing is wholly known. It's always open to what is new. It's looking at possibility, therefore not narrowing down to certainty. It sees everything as in a flow and perceives how holes come and go within that flow. It picks up on what is not explicit, sees that things change with their context, is aware of the unique and sees it as alive and presencing uh, to the consciousness of the beholder. That seems to me to be a good description of the difference between a mentality which tries all the time fussily analytically to fit things into boxes and make sense of them according to a system that it's already decided is the only way of understanding things and the way of being open to possibilities neither being pulled too much to one extreme or to the other the left hemisphere tends to be very black and white either or either it's one of these or it's one of those it has little patience with the right hemisphere saying well it might be this, or it might be that, or it could be something else altogether. It has certain qualities that are not compatible with the way you are thinking about it. So it tends to be much more open to paradox. In fact, what is called paradox is often a contrast between the closed down view of the left hemisphere and the opened up view of the right hemisphere, which always includes that of the left. The right hemisphere is inclusive where the left hemisphere is exclusive. So while the left hemisphere is saying it's either or it's or, the right hemisphere is saying, I think it's both and, and either or. So what we need, according to the right hemisphere, is both and, and either or. Not either both and, or either or. I, I, I trust that's as clear as mud. Anyway, there we are. Um, I think that tells you something about uh, the, the way, the middle way, but I'd like to say something in conclusion and then I open it up to, to questions. What is meant by a middle way is not just 
a compromise. Compromises do come into it, of course, because we live in a real world. But there is all so something which is not like a midway point, but a moving in two directions at once that to the ordinary everyday mind of the left hemisphere appear to be opposite, but are actually parts of a dipole. This is imaged best for me in a saying of Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic philosopher, who I still consider probably the most profound philosopher that ever lived. And he said, they do not understand how a thing agrees with itself while opposing itself. It is a harmony like that of the bow or the lyre. And what he means is that in the string of a bow and in the string of a lyre, what happens is it is pulled in opposite directions maximally. That might sound to the left hemisphere like a waste of effort. Why not stop pulling in two opposite directions and just let the string go slack? But if you do, you haven't got a bow, you haven't got a lyre. The arrow shoots from the bow, the lyre comes forth from the, the sorry, the note comes forth from the lyre at right angles to the tension that is maintained through being true to two opposites at once. Well, I'm going to leave it now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, I've had quite a few questions come through in the chat, so um, if, if people don't mind, I will ask them uh, to, to unmute themselves and ask. I'm actually going to ask one on behalf of someone who um, isn't able to uh, physically ask the question. Um, but uh, this, this person, Fraser, says, um, I'll be very interested in how Ian sees his work fitting within polit uh, political philosophy. Um, are there schools of thought within political philosophy that are more friendly to the left or right hemisphere? Ah, okay. Um, yes, there are. And it has nothing whatever to do with left and right in politics. Nor is it, as some people have said to me, obviously the left hemisphere is right wing and the right hemisphere is left wing. Uh, this is due to a prejudice of our age. There are thoroughly left hemisphere philosophies on the left in politics and thoroughly left hemisphere philosophies on the right in politics. Equally, there are thoroughly right hemisphere philosophies on the left in politics and thoroughly right hemisphere ones on the right. And what the key qualities of them seem to me is that they don't just espouse theory. They are humane, compassionate, they understand the need for making, for balancing opposites. They are not absolutist, they're not dogmatic, they're not triumphalist, they're not me mechanistic in the way they conceive things. They are able to balance the fulfillment of an individual with the fulfillment of a society, both of which are needed at once, and both of which are not necessarily contradictory to one another. Um, but of course you can have, uh, you can have totalism uh, in which all that is lost um, manifestly in uh, left way. Let, we've had seen many left-leaning empires in the last hundred years that have been um, extreme examples of totalitarianism. But, but also there is a kind of um, empire building of capitalism in which the same thing happens really uh, in a slightly more benign guise, but is nonetheless destructive. Whereas I feel that what needs to be achieved is a balance in relationship between the individual and society, which is something like the image of what works in a small social group or even in a couple, perhaps easiest to image in a couple. Uh, a good functioning couple is not one in which the two parties are fused, nor is it one in which they are somehow opposed to one another and don't hang together. It's one in which they hang together with all their opposites but each is fulfilled in, in through, and through the relationship so that they become more themselves through the relationship, not less themselves. Our relationship as citizens in a society is that the society gave birth to us. We're not atomistic. We don't somehow spring out of the cosmos fully formed. We are ourselves expressions of a society and we give back to that society and contribute to that society. That would be a very right hemisphere way of thinking about uh, politics. So in brief, that would be my answer. There's a lot more to say, of course. Okay, thank you. Um, Olivia Dates, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello. Can you hear me? 
Yes. My question was about autism and how that fits or how you see that fitting in the brain lateralization. Okay, thank you. Whether it's, um, it's as simplistic as is sometimes presented. I don't think it is. So I think the first thing I would say is that there are probably autisms, not just autism. Um, okay. And for mm -hmm. example, you can contrast a very famous uh, spokeswoman for autism, who is uh, um, Temple Grandin, um, who was amazed to hear that people thought in words. She herself could only think in pictures. But there are plenty of people with autism who cannot picture things or image them, they think serially in language. So what I think has happened in autism is that um, whatever this proper balance is, has got disturbed. And very often, it, it has to be said, um, that I, I wouldn't wish to say this is a blanket image of autism, but there is an extraordinary amount of evidence that people with autism have um, peculiarities of uh, thought and behavior, which are those of um, people with right hemisphere deficits. So they, they don't understand the implicit and they find it hard to read faces. And, you know, there's probably about 20 different characteristics. I talk about it briefly in um, the book that has not yet been published. Um, so I think um, there's some evidence. What is absolutely fascinating is that both in schizophrenia and autism, of course, they're quite distinct conditions, but they have sometimes overlapping features such that psychiatrists talk about the schizoautistic spectrum. The, one of the things we've most excitingly discovered in the last um, five to ten, 10 years is that the right hemisphere is, well, both hemispheres are held together by long tracts that span the entire hemisphere from the posterior to the frontal lobes and synthesize and unite the activity of the hemisphere as a whole, which is one of the reasons that I'm rather against all this um, modular atomistic stuff. Well, it, you can't talk about a hemisphere, you have to talk about this tiny region, because very often what happens in a tiny region affects the entire hemisphere. But in any case, uh, so hemispheres are much more intraconnected than they are interconnected. And what um, enables this to happen is two or three very prominent long white matter tracts. And what makes them work so well is that they are myelinated. That means they have a sheath of, of myelin around them, which, which makes them white. What we mean by white matter is nerves that are uh, myelinated. And what is the point of myelination? To speed and facilitate transmission. And it now seems that in both autism and um, schizophrenia, there are problems in the myelination of these tracts, so they're not working um, in the way that they perhaps normally would. There are also abnormalities in the corpus callosum, um, but I think that we get into some more technical area there. Okay. But um, I hope that some of what you're interested in will be answered in, uh, in my new book when it comes out. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Um, could we have uh, Mark Downey, could you ask your question if you uh, unmute yourself? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, hello, Ian. Hello. Hello, hello, very nice to see you again. Um, you know, I, my child is home at the moment, like a lot of people, she's three years of age. We have noticed that she um, has thrived in terms of her creativity and, and um, yeah, just generally in terms of her communication, her ability to be able to play at but multi-levels, you know, very nuanced, complicated play. And my tendency is to go with that and get in there and play as well with her as I can. Um, and, but there is a feeling of, gosh, we should be, because we're friends, we're like, no, we, we're, we're structuring them, we're homeschooling them, we're teaching them to, to read. And, you know, I just, we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, and you try to read as much as you can about this, but um, I, I really value your point of view and, uh, you know, would love to hear what you think about this. 
Well, thank you. It, it's a difficult question because, um, you know, there's no one uh, clear answer and I can't, obviously, I wouldn't wish to be dogmatic. Uh, um, as somebody who loved reading and, and read uh, early, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, though, quite clearly in the Steinerian tradition, uh, it's something that is not encouraged very early. And, and I'm a great believer in uh, Steinerian education. Uh, and also Sweden, I believe, which has one of the highest rates of literacy in the world. They don't normally expect children to be reading and writing till they're seven or so. So I, I wouldn't like to say, but for me, reading was a huge pleasure. Um, and I think play uh, is, is great, but there may be, I mean, I think it's wonderful that you spend time playing with your children and uh, nothing can possibly be, be um, anything other than, than, than wonderful for both of you in that. But also it's okay for children to play on their own in an undirected way and even to be on their own. I mean, I don't remember ever in all my life being bored. I mean, if you get to the point where you might have been bored, you find something to interest you. And uh, so I think we're too worried, you know, about stimulation. It's one of the problems of our era, obviously, is overstimulation. And many of the best things in life only come when you are not being stimulated, when you are... Um, being quiet and discovering things for yourself inside and outside and around you. So um, I think the great thing is to work with enthusiasm, uh, the enthusiasm of the child and your own enthusiasm. If it's not going somewhere where both of you can feel the spark of enthusiasm, that's probably a test that it's not going to the right place. Okay. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I've got a question from a Sarah. Now, I think there's more than one Sarah. So this is Sarah who describes herself as a psychological therapist. If you want to unmute and ask your question to Ian. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's me. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, so, I mean, well, yeah, as a, as a psychological therapist, um, I believe part of what um, you're referring to with respect to this sort of reliance on the land Sorry, it's, it's hard to know with these internet things if it's if it's frozen for everyone. Um, well, it, it's froze for me. Oh, sorry, did you hear me? No, no you, sorry, you sorry. Yeah. Oh dear, am I having some connection problems? Did you hear any of it? <laughs> Just no, the first few words. Did. Try again. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I was so... Can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. So I was saying uh, in my line of work um, as a therapist, I'm coming from the point of view that, um, of early development and early relational difficulties are things that obviously manifest all the time. Um, and I find a large proportion of the people I'm seeing and working with have developed, I suppose, what you might describe as left hemisphere ways of coping in, in that they need to know, they need certainty, because that kind of makes this daily task of living um, safer and more controlled and I wondered if you had any views on that and um, on an individual level and I suppose the part it might be playing more broadly in society in terms of you know, the master and his emissary in that sense. Yes well I think that you know there's a lot one could say about that um, perhaps starting at the most broad um, people are far too worried about control and having got it, so to speak. And part of my role as a psychiatrist was explaining that actually not being in control and not feeling like you've got it um, is not only unavoidable if you're properly alert as a human being, but, but a perfectly benign state of affairs. And we're too worried about, you know, being in control and, and knowing the exactness. It seems to me that the purpose of an education is to wake up whatever it is inside us that is inside all of us that is capable of appreciating um, the complexities and to see something new because in fact we're always creating not 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 in some uh, very explicit way like you know making a painting or, or writing a poem but in our understanding of the world, if it's to mean anything at all, it's got to come out of us as well. 
and meet something. It's not just something that's posted in. And my problem with a lot of modern education is that it's about pushing things in to children, not drawing things out from them, which is, of course, as you know, the root word, root of the idea of education. Um, this for me is best prefigured because um, a long time ago I was a, a, a literary uh, scholar at Oxford. Uh, in, in what I gather is now going on in schools where, for example, you might be studying Jane Austen. And in order to get an A star at A level, there are six things you have to say about Jane Austen. Well, <laughs> it seems to me this is a, the death of poor Jane because really, unless you are responding to this thing and finding something new in it, then uh, y y you're, not really, you're not really reading it. You're not really understanding it. And so far from encouraging people to engage, it's sort of putting a screen between them and the work of art. I know you're talking about much younger children, but when it comes at that level too, you know, I think we've got to have this balance between the fact that we are actually shepherding children into certain things that they will need to know, skills they do need to have, um, and that are not in any way bad in themselves, but also not uh, making that a way of sort of closing down, uh, above all, not closing down their curiosity and enthusiasm. So I think, you know, it's a difficult thing being a good teacher. I sometimes wonder why we have um, teacher training schools at all, because they always inculcate a body of doctrines about what is good and bad teaching. It seems to me that either you are a good teacher, in which case you will discover it in the process of teaching, or you're not. <laughs> and you, you probably won't make a good teacher out of somebody who hasn't got it in them, if you know what I mean. It's slightly like you meet people occasionally who you think, there's something slightly odd. This person's making all the right noises, but it's like they're the product of a very good social skills training course. Somehow it's not kind of real. And you, you can learn all the modes, but I think that a good teacher is somebody who lives their own enthusiasm and knows how to contact that in the child and build on it. Slightly, as I was saying to um, Mark um, in the previous conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, next, could we have uh, Peter Williams, if you want to unmute and ask your question, Peter. Maybe. Is he with us? <laughs> Sorry, that's Mark, Mark's little girl. <laughs> Here we go. Right. Oh, hello, um, Mr. Peter. Sorry, I've got... Yeah, go on. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was wondering um, in your talk whether we have to accept uh, the balance that uh, we've been dealt, um, the balance between the hemispheres that we've been dealt or that we grow out of or we grow into. Um, so when you, when you look at, you know, the little spots in newspapers that they call a brain gym, um, which is, you know, sharpening up on the speed of our doing uh, addition or division or whatever, um, that looks like it's for the left hemisphere. Um, so I wonder if you could rec uh, recommend uh, any gym work uh, for, for the right. Cryptic crosswords. Yeah, cryptic crosswords. Okay, crosswords. not non-cryptic crosswords. Non-cryptic crosswords test um, kind of general information and knowledge. Um, of course, using your left hemisphere is very important, and not allowing it to go on the blink yeah. is one of the ways of remaining agile. So very good. But uh, the only sort of similar thing that it seems to me a perfect training of the right hemisphere is cryptic crosswords, which personally I love. They're my <laughs> almost addiction because in them you're doing all sorts of things all the time you're not closing down to the obvious surface meaning here you're you're allowing your brain to ramify to all the meanings of these possible words and make connections like reading a poem um, and also you have to have a sudden insight which is robustly associated with the right superior temporal sulcus and gives that pleasurable aha moment when the thing comes into focus Again, not building up serially in left hemisphere way, but like a picture suddenly coming into focus, which is very right hemisphere appreciation. So I don't expect this was what you wanted me to say, but <laughs> since you were so specific <laughs> about the brain, that is something that if you don't know cryptic crosswords or you think you're 
and you're not going to like them. There are places on the web where you can learn how to begin. And once you've got it, you won't want ever to stop. There's <laughs> <laughs> many other things one can do. We don't have to accept, to be serious, we don't have to accept, uh, as you say, the, the cards we're dealt with. Um, the one thing I want to uh, emphasize is that though in the book I suggest there are phases in civilization where we've managed the balance better than at other times. And that at the present time we uh, have over stressed the model of the left hemisphere. It's not that fundamentally our brains are now not capable. All the capability is, is there. Um, one image I sometimes use is that of a radio which uh, you, you begin by exploring and after a while you just tune into this one station and when you press on it always goes to that station. But it, the other stations are still there to be contacted, it's just that you've decided only to tune into one. That seems to me the way we are at the moment, we tune in to the, the, um, the way of being, the way of thinking, the model of the world, the take on it of the left hemisphere. And we can deliberately shift one towards the right hemisphere by engaging with the arts, with music, by doing meditation, by being still and thoughtful, you know, all these things are very, very good. And being with nature for me. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, Nina, Nina Davis, uh, would you like to ask your question? Hello, sorry about that. My mute button's a bit sticky. Um, That's fine. That's yes. <laughs> From the 19th century, there has been a scientific focus on attempting to find differences between the male and female brains. And uh, it's been po become popular in recent years uh, to call scientists or feminist scientists that downplay these differences as science deniers. Um, have you got a view on this? And who is in denial? Uh, well, of course, I have the disadvantage of not knowing what you believe. And the very fact that you ask the question means that this is a matter of some import to you. So I'm going to have to be very careful in what <laughs> I say. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you want me to be honest? And the answer is, uh, it's to be in denial to think that there aren't differences. Of course there are differences. I mean, the same people who think there shouldn't be differences are the people who think that being embodied is very important. Well, our bodies are different for a start, and our brains are part of our bodies. And we come also equipped by millennia of evolution. So, you know, it would be extraordinary if there weren't differences. So, yes, there are, and there are quite a lot of them. What you make of them, anybody's guess, really. But, you know, it's definitely denial to say there are. Yeah. And, and have you got a view on, I mean, I, I don't think anyone says there aren't any differences, but my sense, I guess, to, is, is that there has been an over-focus on the differences. But I mean, well, that's, that's, very, that's very interesting, because of course I see the opposite, which is that these things are barn door to neuro, neurologists, uh, neuropsychiatrists, neuro, neuropsychologists, but then taboo in our society and so there's actually been uh, a propaganda war by people saying no 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 there aren't any differences well you know most of us don't like to speak out because we don't like to be um singled out as terrible monstrous whatever it is but you know science is science and make what you like of it really and it's what and you said what you make of it you're not sure you, what, well, yes, because, because making the leap from differences in structure and function, which there are, I mean, of course, the, there are far more commonalities than there are differences. I mean, it goes without saying, but there are differences and they're quite, they're quite extensive. They're not just a little bit here and there, but on the whole, in functional terms, the, the differences are not so important. So what, what exactly does one make of these differences? Um, one of the things that fascinates me is that often laterality has been missed because samples, clinical sample, no, not clinical, well, yes, yeah, sometimes clinical, but, but also experimental samples are often 
roughly 50-50 men and women. Now, as we now discover for many, many functions, uh, women use their left hemisphere for things that men use their right hemisphere for. Now, you heard me right. It may shock you or surprise you. The evidence is that the right hemisphere is much more important to men than it is to women. But then you've got to reckon on the fact that the right hemisphere and left hemisphere are more differentiated in men. They're more similar to one another in women. And that can be interpreted in one of two ways. It can be good or bad because evolution has required that they work together, but also that they are distinct. So it's a hugely interesting philosophical topic. But so that's why I say quite what you make of it, I wouldn't really like to say. But I mean, I do advert to it in my new book in an extremely extensive footnote <laughs> in which I can give the evidence but, and then to duck to cover. <laughs> <laughs> thank you anyway okay <laughs> okay thank you nina um next could i ask uh, barbara could you unmute yourself and ask your question if you don't mind i'm, I'm coming i'm coming <laughs> that's fine hello hello barbara hi hello barbara hello ian um just wow <laughs> <laughs> from me um so many pings going off um i'm um i'm i work in the prison service well prison and probation service and i'm um we've got quite a, a tricky job as you can imagine in leadership development um because uh, lots of political influences to start with um and an ingrained well we think quite different cultures between probation and um and prison but um very command and control versus relational and i'm thinking oh left right this um that sort of and you know leadership models seem to kind of say a lot of that as well um they're sort of reflective of it um so and gestalt is one of my um, i'm a big fan of gestalt um we're using a lot of psychometrics and i'm just thinking uh, i wonder if you've got any i know this is a sort of broad question um, but any tips for leadership development, um, given your, you know, your work and um, how important it is to start trying to get more balance between the two? Um, you're right, it's a very broad question. And so that I don't go completely off beam, could you try to <clears throat> slightly make more specific what you're asking me? Well, I think we um, we want people to be. <laughs> I suppose we want we want people to be more fully functioning um, individuals, and um, and I, I suppose I'm I'm getting myself a little bit caught up now. Perhaps I I knew that in a way. Um, maybe I can uh, just ask you around. Um, we use a lot of psychometrics um, and. And I, I just wonder if, if, you're, uh, if you're a fan of psychometrics in terms of helping people to become better leaders and if there is anything in particular. So I see in the MBTI, I see kind of leanings towards the, you know, the specific and the, uh, the more general um, sort of view, uh, right and left. And, and I'm just wondering if there's, if there's anything you can offer um, in, in response to that, you know, what insights that we might get around those? Um, MBTI being the Myers Briggs. Yes, yes, the Myers Briggs yeah. inventory. Yeah, type yes. inventory. Type inventory. Yeah, are you yes. familiar with any which, which, of the leaders? Yeah, sorry. Well, no, I'm just thinking because quite a lot of people listening may not know what that is, but it's a. Yeah. I think it really broadly based on 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 Jung, but it tends to categorise yeah. people along. Um, for well, four different uh, poles, if you like. Um, well, I think it can be helpful, um, but I don't think it should be gospel. It, it, it's the usual thing that the left hemisphere, and it is somewhat left hemispheric, wishing to categorize and so on, uh, can be great of great help. My message is not that we'd all be better off if we had a left hemisphere stroke. Um, we wouldn't. Um, we need both our hemispheres to be working well together. The optimal way in which they work together 
is for the left hemisphere to be a servant to the right. It's when it becomes or believes itself to be the master that things go wrong. In our world, the world of administration, of bureaucracy, of algorithms, of categories, of rules, uh, of assessments and scores and so on, um, has become the master. Whereas, yeah. in my view, it's a very useful servant. So these things tell us something. Of course they tell us something. We wouldn't be doing them otherwise. So I, I, I'm, I'm neither a fan nor an enemy. I, I think they have their place. Very useful. Mm. But of course, when you're dealing with any individual human being, you've got to get on all fours, as it were, with that person. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's rather like what I say about the way the hemispheres work in terms of learning, a, learning to play an instrument. You know, to begin with, you're delighted by this piece that you want to play. You try playing it, and then you realize, oh, well, I've got to go and look at this fingering, and I see what's happening here. We're returning to the tonic and all this. So that's all very helpful. But then when you actually, you know, play the piece, you've got to forget all that and just encounter the piece. So I think that having all that stuff going on is useful. But if that is the end of the process, it would be like saying, okay, after doing the fingering and having, I'm not going to play the piece. I, you know, I now know it. Well, no, we don't. We actually have to put it back into into the real world and then and you know sometimes um yeah being a little bit sort of left hemisphere uh, it, as one might say speaking loosely very very loosely uh, is is not a bad thing so for example for certain personality types um who are, are really very distressed because they haven't got proper boundaries um a very boundary system is enormously beneficial so I'm sure you've come across this. I mean, I've had patients who say that the period they spent in jail was actually, in some ways, the best thing that ever happened for them. They knew yeah. where they were, they understood the boundaries, they were contained. And when they didn't have that, they were all over the place and they didn't like themselves. So, you know, I think it's a hard one. There are no rules, really. <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Um, yes, I, I think there's a lot of bad press about the prison but there's a huge amount of good work going on and we've got a long 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 way to go um but um thank you um because uh, yeah i see that in women's prisons in particular uh where um it gives them an opportunity to find themselves sometimes ironically so thank you so no, much well, I, I think we've probably got to stop but i'm just going to say one thing because it amuses me um years and years and years ago i worked in the um uh, emergency clinic at the Maudsley Hospital, which is the biggest emergency clinic for psychiatry in London. And um, some, some of the patients um, would be classifiable as mad, and some of the patients could be classifiable as bad. And there were some who knew perfectly well what they were doing, but traded on the fact that they were patients at the Maudsley to go into a, um, a, a takeaway and trash the place. And the, the police would come along and the person would say, I'm a patient at the Maudsley. They'd put them in the van and bring them to the Maudsley and say, over to you. And I would say, no, hang on, wait a minute. Don't you go away. This guy, bring him into court in the morning and throw the book at him. It's the best thing you could do. I can't do that. So we've got a strange set of circumstances in which the police are trying to be psychiatrists and I'm trying to be a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> It anyway. is. It's, the, it's those two things. Yes, thank you. And I, I also spent time at the Maudsley, um, and, uh, but that's another story, another life. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ian, if, have you got time for one more, a quick one? Uh, I know you, need, you might uh, need a rest before. All the time you like, but I'm just worried about your schedule, but I've got the time, yeah. No, no, no that's fine. No, we, so um, the, for, for people who are uh, hopefully aware, um, in half an hour there's going to be an art symposium with Stephen Batchelor and, and Ian again, um, chaired by Robert. So uh, when this session is finished, obviously uh, there'll be a, a bit of a pause. The, the art symposium has a, a new, it's a different meeting. There's a new um, link for you to follow to join that meeting. So. Um, I'm just saying that so that people don't just lurk around in this meeting. I will be terminating this meeting because um, the next the next session has a different code. Okay, um, so one last thing was uh, uh, to bring in Catherine Weir, who's actually um, going to be speaking this afternoon. So, uh, Catherine, do you want to say your question? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Oh, okay, just just a quick one, Ian. I admire your work enormously, and I think everything you're, you've got to offer is brilliantly helpful. I, I, I work in education. I just wanted to... 
kind of just strike a note of caution about something you said earlier um, about why do we need teacher education or training colleges? Because I think, you know, I think personally that's that's a kind of dangerous view. It's slightly Govian. Why do we need experts? Um, it's through one of the things that's gone horribly wrong is the trashing of university education for teachers. And in Finland, in fact, one of the reasons why their education is so good is because they educate all their teachers to master's level. And mm. we've, we've progressively de-skilled and de-professionalised our teachers till all they can do is follow government edicts. And, you know, um, and, and it's, it's a terrible shame. And it's, it's through university education for teachers that the kind of excellent work that someone like you is doing will get into the minds of teachers and if it just degenerates into common sense so i just i mean i'm just in a sense waving a flag i guess for some of the things i'll say this afternoon but um you know let's all respect each other's professions you know you, you can't be a common sense psychiatrist i mean you need common sense and you need to be the right person but similarly there's a lot to learn about being a teacher and a lot of of important things to know so let's just respect each other's professions a bit i just got a bit a bit agitato at that point sorry i just felt i needed to say that really Perfectly reasonable, and I, I unreservedly apologise. I mean, I, I, I often uh, say things in a slightly flip way, um, just to sort of stir up the waters a bit. But uh, no, of course you're, you're, you're right. Uh, the only thing I would say is that it's great if it's really education, not in, not instilling a sort of Absolutely. bunch of doctrines, which there has been a, a tradition that. Perhaps it isn't the case anymore in teacher training. I've known quite a few adults who wanted to train as teachers and they said that um, they were so indoctrinated into a certain way of doing things that they actually gave up the teacher training. And from my knowledge of their characters and their sophistication and personalities, I know they would have made very good teachers. I don't think that many of the teachers I had and from whom I learned a lot would have attended a, a, a teacher training course. So I think that's the other side of it. But I certainly don't mean to God no, to disrespect teachers. I think teachers are invaluable. Teachers are incredibly important. I guess and one of the things that's coming up to teachers is that we don't, teachers, not we don't pay teachers. We don't pay teachers enough. We, we, we treat them as a sort of, um, you know, fairly low functioning profession which of course absolutely they're not well that's I mean, what, we I, live in a world that's what i'm saying Ian, really that, you know it's because it's become deprofessionalized and tips for teachers and and it's it's a political matter you know we need solid university education for our teachers not oh, you know, absolutely you know and it needs no, no, we need a lot of training so i mean we, i think you and i are on the same page on this one i'm sure we are we need the best teachers that we can possibly get and we need to reward them well thank you Thanks. Yes, uh, as a teacher, that's an excellent place to end. Thank you. <laughs> um, right, so um, thank, thank you very much again, Ian, um, for, for giving more of your time today uh, to speak. Uh, and also thank you, as I said at the beginning, um, for uh, continuing to be a patron of the society. Uh, and it, was, it was great to hear there, um, especially in response to those questions, how you, know, how you can uh, bring a middle way um, in from your uh, neurological perspective. Right, okay, uh, so I've already said there's a, um, another session at half past. It's a, uh, a different uh, joining link for that one. So I'm going to terminate this meeting now and a recording uh, should become available fairly soon on the Middleway website. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>